And welcome to a special bonus episode of The Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And today we're very excited to have with us as our guest, Lee Miracle. Lee Miracle is a writer and a teacher, an artist and a performer, an elder and an inspiration to many. She's one of the Stolo people who are part of the Pacific Coast Salish Nation and a granddaughter of Chief Dan George. Lee has written many award-winning books of poetry, fiction, and nonfiction, including her wonderful book, Memory Serves, which we featured on this podcast last January. Her most recent books are Conversations with Canadians, a nonfiction work that sets out the grounds for what a shared future might look like for settlers and Indigenous people, and the collaborative book Hope Matters, written with her daughters Kalimpa Bob and Tanya Carter. And some of her other work includes her groundbreaking book I Am Woman and her novels Raven Song and its sequel Celia Song. Thanks for joining us, Lee. Hi. I was just counting my books the other day. There's 14. How about that? There's a lot of books. (laughs) I'm a CM for my nation. we don't have the term elder. And um, mm. the governor general likes me to mention that I'm also officer of the Order of Canada or whatever it's called. That's amazing. And um, no, we were really eager to talk with you about many things, but one of them being um, sort of following on our episode on Great Expectations. And it's a book that stands out in my mind, um, thinking about conversations with you, because I remember you quoting it more than once, and it was clearly a, a book a book that meant things. And I know you allude to it also in your, uh, your Bobby Lee. Yes, I do. <laughs> well, the, it started that, that my the father of my children said I had to go get book to read to my children. So I went to the library with a wagon, <laughs> but I didn't know what books they'd like. And I picked up all kinds of classics I liked <laughs> because I had to read them. And he says he meant children's books. And I said, no, they'll get that in school. They should hear something real first. So I started with uh, Great Expectations. We went on to some of the Shakespeare stuff, and I performed a lot of it. So that's probably why I remember it so well. But they'd also repeat what they liked. You know, like when the, they are playing the card game, it was, I think it was Beggar Your Neighbor or something. And um, and I'd say, oh, she beggared him. And they'd say, oh, she beggared him. And they'd repeat it. But the thing that they got from it, which is really hard to come by for colonized people because we're so um, bullied into not having a sense of self and a sense of any expectations out of this country at all, is mm-hmm. they did get expectations. So that when they got older, they expected that if they put their shoulder to the plow, that they would get, you know, the land to turn over. And that, I think, made a huge difference in their life. Also, in Great Expectations, he fails a lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And of course, colonized people don't have much success. But you get up, dust yourself off in Great Expectations, then you have another go at it. He also yeah. fails at love, which is kind of uh, good to know that it doesn't always work out. But you can still get up, dust yourself off, and get going again. So all of my children are like that. All four of them, they they don't have a sense of all is all is lost, and that doesn't ha- happen very often with Indigenous people. So, some of the classics like Dickens uh, are valuable to us because he's also talking about capitalism and its earlier mm-hmm. stages. And we were in our earlier stages of capitalism, even though it was the only industrial revolution was over for everybody else. It was just starting for us. So that's part of why it became such a valuable text for us, is that they made me read it over and over, even when they were 17. (laughs) I just read it out loud. I'm really struck by you talking about reading out loud to your children, because this is something that... I also have experienced even even when my kids were all grown, they would they would ask for that. And there's something something different that happens when you're reading out loud to one another. Very different from just reading words on a page. Yeah, warmth of the voice comes through. the The person that's doing the reading is also immersed in the text, and there's mm-hmm. a performance to it that becomes mm-hmm. really entertaining for everybody. And I and a a, a single look at text 
um, that can't happen any other time. You, you can read texts on your own, and, you know, there's something good about that, of course. And then you can discuss it, and there's something good about that. But it's completely different when you're in the moment, you're all together, and you're mm-hmm. responding to what's being uh, heard and what's happening, because it begins to happen instead of just being read. It's it's actually occurring in the room, you know, and it makes everybody all excited. <laughs> Chris and I were talking a little bit um, when we were recording the regular episode on Great Expectations. We were talking a little bit about how the work was originally published, you know, a couple chapters at a time, serialized in the newspaper. And people would read it together and read aloud to one another and kind of debate about what was going to happen next and so on. And so that kind of experience has been part of that book from the beginning. Yes, from the very beginning. And I think that it was because uh, not everyone could necessarily read in a household. Mm-hmm. But you could always mm-hmm. find someone in the family that could read, and it was a it became a social event. It also was that way in my community. We we had we uh, read on Friday and Saturday at my mother's home to each other, uh-huh. and my uh-huh. relatives that couldn't read would come over. And we'd have a big household of people listening to a story, and other kids that you know were listening to it would get up and perform parts, and you know it just became a really big show. Uh, in the household uh-huh. and a social event and a, a way of coming together that was really different. And I remember my Ta'a, who's a great grandmother, barely spoke English, but she'd watch the performance and listen to the words. Mm-hmm. And I remember her wanting to hear Pip again. You know, the, uh, whenever she said, whenever you read Pip, come and tell, come and get him. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds lovely. That's so great. You know, when you're talking about that 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 oral performance and that story out loud, it makes me think about something that's been on my mind, this question of what is fiction for? What is story for? You know, in the universities, if we're teaching where we talk about fiction and nonfiction, we kind of anatomize the books we read in that kind of like taxonomical kind of way. But story is something different. It's not exactly the same thing as fiction, is it? No, it isn't. But I think we're changing the definition of nonfiction. I think that's happening, mm-hmm. and I think it started with mm-hmm. myself, and they started mm-hmm. calling it mm-hmm. creative nonfiction. But other Indigenous mm-hmm. people are are transforming their lives into story, as opposed to, mm-hmm. you know, differentiating between fiction and nonfiction. There's a different mm-hmm. language that goes with nonfiction that's very expository, and in fact, it it weakens the body to read out loud. <laughs> and it's like a textbook, you know, oh God, I'll never get through this. <laughs> yeah. But we liven it up like story so that we can be enlivened by the text. And I mm-hmm. think that's mm-hmm. the purpose of story in the first place, is that oral story was an enlivening event that was community-based. And uh, mm-hmm. when when novels came out, the first thing that the aristocrats, the men of letters, they called them, who met, you know, every Saturday in the drawing rooms of the rich, was make rules about stories mm-hmm. so that they were, I think, dumbed down in a way mm-hmm. that was difficult for, you know, ordinary people to, to relate to. And I think that's the value of Dickens, who who didn't get talked about very much in those drawing rooms. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, he spent time yeah, in jail. Yeah. So he probably paid no attention to the writings about his writings. He just wanted to do what he wanted to do to make a living. I think Chekhov was the same, too. Chekhov was interested in making a living. So he's very entertaining. Mm-hmm. The entertainment is part of selling the work. It was important, you know. <laughs> No, it's true with Dickens, and I'm, I, I don't know as much about Chekhov, but with Dickens, it's true that generation after generation was reading him, like he was taken up in a really popular way, like right away, and uh, not just in England, but in North America as well. Um, and it's interesting that he speaks to different people in different ways over time. Yes, he does. Um, and, and it doesn't uh, lose its, uh, its, its power. And you were saying before about 
the power of capitalism in there and the ways in which, in some ways, that's about that 19th century moment. But it's also, how can I put it, it's not something that's completely behind us, right? It's not. I, I think that it, get, it gets deeper and deeper into the global economy by the minute, but it, it, it's not as deep in, in every part of the world as it is in North America. And, you know, for instance, the North, they don't even have running water up there, so capitalism doesn't, they don't have a store to shop at, they don't have jobs to go to, you know, they don't have any of that. They're still back hunting, fishing, and um, doing the best they can to stay alive in in, uh, very old conditions. So Mm -hmm. not even all of Canada is is, uh, part of that capitalist system necessarily. And so the the tax credit expectations probably doesn't mean as much to them as they probably more lost in the barren land. <laughs> you know, they get that. Yeah. Say, oh yeah, we've been lost, and then they start telling stories about getting lost. But Great Expectations is very much urban reservation, close to a city kind of um, indigenous book. Because there's like two worlds, right? There's like that the village that Pip comes from and there's the city he goes to and he wants to still belong to the village that he came from. But once he's become part of that city life, it's extremely difficult for him to connect again. And I was thinking about that a little bit when I was looking back at that that passage in your Bobby Lee, where you say something, I was very moved by this. You say, I read lots of Pearl S. Buck, and the one I liked the least then is my favorite now. The good earth didn't appeal to me because I was trying to bury the self that felt that way about the earth. I wanted to forget the grasses who had comforted me and the trees who had been my friends when no one else was there for me. I didn't want the good earth. I had great expectations. And this idea of this sort of split between the grasses and the trees and the good earth and this other thing, I thought that really struck me really forcibly. Yeah. Now, though, I think um, you can have the great expectations and still have the trees and the earth. I mean, I find a way to reconcile those two things over the years because the reason I was trying to reconcile them eventually is, well, not everybody's going to give up have life. So we have to learn to love the earth as we are. You know, we are, we are who we are. And we have to learn to to cherish things. You know, one of the things I did was give up a car uh, mm-hmm. when I turned 50. And I said, okay, I don't need this anymore. I'm not trucking five kids around and all that kind of stuff. But then as I went along, I realized, wait a minute, I got a little patch of land here at 20 by 30. It's outside. And mm-hmm. I'm trucking, you know, vegetables from California, tomatoes from California to here when I can jolly well grow them. And it's my main staple, tomatoes and potatoes mm-hmm. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and peppers, you know. Mm-hmm. I use a lot mm-hmm. of that stuff. So I started growing what I could. I'm even hanging things off of, uh, you know, uh, one of those, it was a, a hammock. I took the hammock out and then hanging plants off of it. And I, uh-huh. I, I, uh-huh. While a lettuce growing, and my daughter's got all of this other stuff going, she's she's just um, doing an amazing job of uh, helping me develop this garden so that we're not using a car to go get something from a grocery store. Because mm-hmm. I realize that we use so much gasoline not driving, <laughs> but, you know, with trucking in of our food and our clothing. So that's another yeah. part is that. You know, I make clothing, I make blankets, I make, I started making things. And it turns out I'm, I'm a bit artistic about it, too, because you can see some of my blankets on the web. They're pretty nice. <laughs> I've seen some of your blankets. They're beautiful. <laughs> and I even, Tom King even made me make one for him, you know. <laughs> I said, okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing when you're you're using, I'm using cloth that's from things that I've already used. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's all secondhand. You're not using more energy. You're, not, you know. So I'm I'm looking at the whole world that way. I'm an urban person. We have to get mm-hmm. dressed up, but how can I get dressed up without y- using non-renewable resources? You know, how right. can I still live this life and not use all this gas and and oil? I hope that Canadians begin to to feel that way about the earth. Mm-hmm at some point. I've been wondering about that too. I've been wondering in particular whether with the pandemic and people 
being in a state where they kind of have to stop and think about what they're using and what they're doing, whether this is something people will like knowledge that people will carry with them going forward and not maybe take that extra flight and maybe not have that car and maybe reuse those materials. I hope that's not well, if you do have to take a flight, there's carbon uh, points you can buy. I've always done that, you know, but and they plant trees somewhere in India for me. And I pay for it, you know, like you've got to pay the extra dollar for your ticket because you're using up non-renewable resources. But again, if you don't have to fly, then don't <laughs> do something else. Now we're using the computer to... Um, communicate with people. I think mm-hmm. I'm going to do a talk uh, with uh, Native Women in the Arts and Senator Sinclair is going to be on it. And they sold oh. 1,700 tickets to listen to that That's talk. Oh, wow. <laughs> and we're not going anywhere. We're sitting in our little whatever, you know, <laughs> our little studies. Or, uh, yeah, he's probably got a study. I have a living room. But, you know, we're talking by a computer and people are listening by a computer. Well, people are hungry for things to listen to and and ways to connect right now, I think, in a way that's a little different from before. Yeah. And if they can listen to you from their own home, that's probably much more accessible for a lot of them. Yeah, they can have a sandwich. Well, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) Worry about knocking things on the floor and stuff. One of the things I was really eager for us to have a chance to talk with you about a little bit, in addition to great expectations in particular, was to talk uh, about one thing we've already discussed a little bit, this question of creative nonfiction and the kinds of things that become possible there. Um, We did an episode together, Chris and I, on your memory serves earlier this year. And that was one of my very favorite episodes, because I think in that book, you're doing something really really powerful, really different, and I think influential. It's it's having an impact, I think, in the world that's really extraordinary. And I was eager to think about that in connection with some of the um, work that Chris and I have been doing with this podcast. We've been doing literature, right, on, in this podcast, but sometimes things that are nonfiction, right? And Your Memory Serves is one of very few that we're doing in that way. And one of the things Chris and I talk about a lot is this question of canon formation, like so-called great books, the books everybody is supposed to read. And some of the books we do are those kinds of books. So like Dante's Inferno or Shakespeare's Tempest or whatever. But we're also sometimes doing books that are a little bit out of the box. And I find myself thinking a lot about that whole question. Like, How do we pick the books we read? Like, what kind of communities are called into being by the choices we make? Okay. Well, first of all, Dante was out of the box when he wrote. (laughs) Inside the box, we should always be going outside the box, because outside the box is the world, inside the box is darkness. (laughs) So what's the light we need today? What, What kind of a flashlight do we need today? You know, is it the end of an iPhone or is it a regular old flashlight or whatever it is? But you want to shine a light on something that has valuable for today. And I think Dante always will. Works that are out of the box in their origins are always Uh going to show that light. Memory served is always going to be valuable. And and I'm absolutely Uh sure of that because it's already, you know, old for me. But people are, oh, my God, look at this. This is so, you know. But the other thing Uh that's valuable about Memory Serves is that I think it's my third totally oral book. It's it's the longest spoken word piece ever. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every part of it, even the editing. Um, Memory Serves, the the title so-called talk, was five pages of manuscript. And Samara said, this is too much. We have to break it down. We have to explain all this stuff. And I said, well, get your typewriter then. She says, it's a computer. And I said, whatever. <laughs> get it out. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to write it. You're going you're gonna to input it. So we sat there and, you know, smoked cigarettes, drank wine, and went through the whole thing. And she input everything. Like she, And then I said, well, you heard the, the last word on this whole thing because we had so many conversations about oratory. And she, it, it was very poetic for us, this business of oratory. And we don't have a different way to express our thinking and our aspirations and our philosophy and our heartfelt sentiments. It's all poetic expression. So it became a very beautiful text. Oh, yeah. But it also is so complex. And 
And I was telling her, you know, she says, you're so awesome. And I said, well, I think I'm all, I've always been better orally than I am on the page. Because on the page, it's an extra leap. And it's a physicality mm. that you don't need to worry about when you're just talking. Yeah. When you're talking, you're using your mind, your heart, and your spirit. But your body is there for you. It's not being used by you. So you don't have to be there for your body. You know what I say? You have you have that mm-hmm. extra push for the thought that you're going through. So it becomes so clear to you what it is that you're after, what you're trying to say, what you want people to know. And the 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 dance of coming to know something shows itself up and it becomes very beautiful. I think that's true of memory serves. That's so fascinating in so many ways. For me, I find it easier to write than to speak. And I think that maybe it has, <laughs> I know it's crazy, right? But I think that has something to do with like early formation. Like uh, for you, your your command of of speech and of oratory is something that 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 must come from you know your early formation the 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 people who raised you the environment you grew in and it's extraordinary but i think it's something that's that's new to me to try to learn to be fully present in the oral in the spoken word in, in a way that's for me has always been easier in the written form it's so interesting to hear you talk about that <laughs> well you don't have when you're speaking or at least the way I learned to speak. What you don't have is the rules of speech all the way through grade school. And I always say this to people, y'all learned grammar in fifth grade, and that was way too soon. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't even know how to talk yet. <laughs> and you're learning grammar of writing. It's so ridiculous. I remember it, like, you know, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog and they're telling you all the parts of speech and why it works and all this sort of stuff. And I remember thinking it was hilarious because most of the students couldn't articulate an idea. They were in fifth grade. That's not the case for me. I had had an mm-hmm. oral education up to that point and mm-hmm. I was magnificent at expressing myself. But mm-hmm. I didn't really care about the rules of speech. That's not mm-hmm. the point. The point is to express something and to express something mm-hmm. of yourself so that you can go forward with that. You're ar- you've are you armed yourself and you're going out and about in the world. And the armor is your words. And you speak so that words are dancing on your skin and always ready for you. You got your weapons always ready. They're they're there at hand. And so the idea of having words available to me to express me, to fight for me, to struggle for me, to articulate me, to deliver me, that was really young in me before I actually went to school. And then getting to school, I was surprised, and, and I don't want to be insulting, but I thought these kids were really stupid. And it's because their teacher was. <laughs> I'm sure they weren't, you know, but that's what I thought. Because I thought, oh, my God, they don't know anything. <laughs> I remember being struck by you, I think, talking about, talking with your grandfather and him talking about how important it was that the words would always dance on your skin, that what you were just describing, the way the words are a kind of armor as you go out in the world. And it's such a powerful image. It would be very difficult to explain, to put into other words, but just the way it is, it kind of captures that sort of power of words that we don't, we can't really capture too well, you know, the the ways in which they take us into the world. Well, I think, uh, you know, to some degree, if you think about great expectations and the mm-hmm. getting up and going again, that there's something of that in that in that text. In a story, there can be mm-hmm. something of that that gives you the power of language to rise again. Think mm-hmm. of all the times mm-hmm. he goes through what happened <laughs> in his head. <laughs> then, he, then he makes a decision about not staying on the ground. You know, I mean, he doesn't put it that way, but he falls down mm-hmm. again. That's the point. You fall down, you get up. And I think words give you that, the power to get up. 
So Mm -hmm. I came to that story with that power, but the story can give it to you too. Yeah, I'm reminded of this um, very beautiful passage that you have in Conversations with Canadians, and it's uh, it's the chapter Appropriation, where you're talking about Indigenous story and what are the right ways of engaging with it and what are the wrong ways, right? And you say something really kind of wonderful about story. Stories are not there to guarantee us a place in the world. They are there to engage the listener in establishing a relationship to the land and help us to build good relations between beings and the land. I encourage all my listeners to use my stories in that way, but they must cite their origins as I do. Stories are our helpers. They lead us to right living, to the good mind, to relationship with one another and the land. Stories help us to be human. In that sense, they are an appeal to the human soul divine, to the spirit, and in this way are spiritual helpers. They cannot be property in the same way that Europeans view their written word. Exactly. And there's so much in that, so much in that. Um, the power of story to, to, to make things happen and to make us be human, to be with one another, to be connected with the world around us. Um, I, I don't know if that's a way that's so familiar to Westerners who are coming through regular schools and universities. I think this is something a lot of people need to learn. I think there's something about... Um about the life you live that can teach you that, though, because we're in the middle of a pandemic now. You know, some people say that mm-hmm. somebody started a pandemic. Some people say, well, the the viruses are, are getting out from under the trees. You know, they, I don't know if you know this, but the viruses and the bacteria grew to live in the roots of the trees. And when you, when you clear cut, they get loose. Mm-hmm. And so, the, you know, a lot of our old people think that's what's happened. But it doesn't matter how it happened. The thing is that everybody has a story about it now. Um, mm-hmm. We have a common mm-hmm. story. And there's so much tragic in uh, this story. I just have a friend named Muriel Miguel of Spider Woman Theater, whose daughter just got COVID and her husband mm-hmm. just died. So the oh. tragedy, and then my, it affects my son, it affects me, it affects my kids, it affects everybody that's a friend of ours. It, it affects the whole theater community because these are per- tremendous performing artists and mm-hmm. one's in danger and the other's already passed away. So we have these stories now that bind us together, that the, the epic of uh, this pandemic. And it's all over the world. On the other hand, our carbon footprint is being lessened because of COVID. Yes. So the earth is recovering now. I'm not saying she did this to us. <laughs> but, you know, there is a, there's a positive to every negative. And, and then that becomes a story too. What if, what if she is alive? What if she just, okay, you're all getting a spanking because you won't listen. <laughs> <laughs> we are stopping to think. Yeah, we're stopping to think about things that we didn't have to stop and think about before. And we're doing things in different ways that we didn't have to do before. I know that we're starting to uh, use Indigenous story in university now, starting next fall, because this is a critical time for it. These stories, we have been here before with natural disaster and horror that comes out of natural disaster and pandemics that comes out of natural disaster. The flood story is right there for us. And this happened 10,000 years ago. And we have stories and teachings that arise out of that. Now, I don't know what we did before to cause all that, but some people say that, well, they think it was a nuclear war. And then Mm -hmm. some scientists agree that there is some evidence of that in North America. So, you know, we could have been these horrible people before that learned something. Yeah, there's a a history of catastrophe, right? And there's something to be learned from the stories that survive from that time. Exactly. So now we should be linking to other catastrophes and other terrible things that happened in the history of humankind. Because we're not the only ones that have endured this. This is this is rec- a recurring nightmare, and mm-hmm. there's lessons to be drawn and things to be learned. And we're also, at least I am thinking, okay, what do we really need? You know, like we need to have contact, human contact, more than we need the things out there. Mm-hmm. And we can't have this human contact right now. And so we have to look to the future, like, are we just going to 
you know, back to normal people keep saying, I hope not. <laughs> yeah. I agree. I agree because people seem to be, like we were saying, stopping, thinking, uh, people are gardening, you know, who, who weren't doing it before. I don't know if they'll stick with it, but at least they've made a beginning. Yes. Right? And, and they're, even my they're son, thinking about said, their place in the world. He said he'd never grow a garden when he watched me grow a garden in a small space and still grow a lot of food. You know, like I, I think I saved myself $3,000 a year by having this garden. And I'm gardening up, and I'm gardening across, and I'm <laughs> we're just every which way that we can. Uh-huh. We're hanging things. But he started to grow a garden that's 30 by 40 feet. Now, that's a lot of space to me. I thought, oh, my God, if I had 30 by 40, I could have this magnificent garden. <laughs> but, yeah, it's important. That, and, you know, if you grow a pumpkin plant, for instance, you've got squash soup all year. Yeah. And and you were saying before that like the pollution levels are going down during this time and, you know, seeing streets empty, it lets people to sort of pause and think about what could be different in the world. What is it going to be like when this is when we're at the end of this time? Exactly. When the gasoline consumption goes down there, we don't need to dig out that oil mess up the tar sands. And we exactly. don't need, you know, all of the things that we think that we have, we, we don't need them. And it just becomes stunning. I, I'm looking at the wall and I have six pairs of shoes, which I don't know if I'll ever be able to wear again because there's a lot of shit, you know? <laughs> right now I'm wearing a pair of moccasins. <laughs> I've just been barefoot all the time. Yeah, there you go. That's another way to go. <laughs> One, one, one last thing I wanted to ask you about was you were talking a little bit just now about Indigenous story being part of the university curriculum, um, and this is something that's been happening over time, but happening more now. Can you talk a little bit more about that, like what that looks like and, and, wh- and why that's important? Well, I'm, I'm working on it because people have called me to help on it, but they, they wanted this course that was, you know, tell it that different but the same, which is the way we work with story. You, you hear a story, you work to understand the story. You create new characters from the story, and you set it in a modern context. Uh, Celia's song is like that. Raven's song is like Mm -hmm. that. Daughters Are Mm -hmm. Forever from the origin story. All my novels and stories are from original story, and I tell it back different but the same. And that's how we work with story. Our stories Mm -hmm. exist as a backbone to create new stories. I think Handmaid's Tale is like that. If you read the Bible, you know, the mm-hmm. Handmaid's Tale is the first mm-hmm. thing that she turned into this magnificent novel. It's a great story. Mm-hmm. You know, but that's how we should work with our stories. That way you avoid the whole business of appropriation, expropriation, and all that kind of stealing mm-hmm. crap. But you also mm-hmm. do things to understand it and recreate it. You're, you're starting to get a creative bent to it. So that's the The plan that we have, and I think there's four stories and four storytellers that we want to use for the course. And, of course, there's discussions and, you know, that sort of thing uh, that go with it and and analysis that goes with it, which, you know, the university really loves, and research, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, that Mm -hmm. goes with it. So it it fits into University of Toronto's main uh, mainstays, you know, which is very, very Western research, blah, 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 analysis, critical uh-huh. thinking, all of that kind of junk, um, which I don't really care for. But we've found a way to work with our story that lines up with the way the university wants courses taught mm. without selling ourselves short, you know, that. So I think that's what, uh, we're planning to do in the fall this course that's um, tell it that different but the same. It also recreates strong an- analysis in our students, strong sense of ties to the land, a strong sense of story and its power, and it uh, allows them to arm themselves with words and go forward. You know that I think that's um, mm-hmm. tremendous. It's just just a tremendous idea that we're working on. Arming them with words so they can go forward. I think that's a, an amazing, amazing thing for them to end on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's been a real treat to sit here silently and get to listen to you talk. Thank you very much, both of you, for, for sharing your thoughts. But especially thank you, Lee, for coming and joining us. Yeah, this has been great. Yeah, it was fun. Excellent. I'm, I'm glad it was. 
Well, listeners, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm, or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We always love to hear from you. Show notes with links for anything we've mentioned in this episode are at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 29B, and The Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time... Until next time, see you again at The Spouter Inn.